Beirut for episode 14 of the Beirut Banyan, and we're joined today by Roderick Surso of the famed Surso family. Before we get to Roderick, if you're enjoying this podcast, please consider a contribution through Patreon. Simply click in the details box below or visit our website, BeirutBanyan.com, and click on the Patreon button. Any contribution is appreciated. This podcast is an independent exploration of Beirut's history through individuals and their stories. No sponsors, no advertisers. And I'm trying to keep the conversations as intimate as possible, which means regular travel. Any contribution is appreciated. Now, I've met Roderick Surso on several occasions, usually within the confines of his Surso Palace Gardens. Whether it's a BBC event debating Iran and Saudi Arabia's influence in Lebanon, whether it's a civil marriage ceremony that took place over the summer, or whether it's simply walking by Surso Palace and running into Roderick by chance and having a friendly chat. And I've been to Surso Museum on numerous occasions. I often go there not to enter the museum itself, but simply to look at the original Martyr's Square statue of the weeping woman. And this statue is so beautiful. The story of the statue itself, of how it was damaged way before the war broke out, how it was replaced, how it survived the Civil War miraculously, and how it's now in a different location in Sursa Museum, but at least it's still visible to the public. I think it's a story to itself, and it's a podcast episode I'll release at a later point. But to be quite honest, the tangential knowledge I know about the Sursa family was limited before I reached out to Roderick and asked him to sit down for this conversation. I knew a bit about his mother's legacy, Lady Yvonne Surso Cochrane. I knew that she's alive and well. I knew that she's given interviews in the past and they're accessible online. And there's one that I will include in the details box below, uh, an interview that she gave not too long ago with Monocle about her perspective on the gradual deterioration of Beirut's architectural beauty and its unfortunate post-war rapid decline. And Roderick was generous with his time, and he let me into the palace, and we sat down for an extensive discussion on things related to his family, to himself personally, and his general opinion on how Lebanon does not work, on ways that it could work better, and his narrow ability to at least hold on to a bit of his family's story. And he drives this point home, that his purpose, or at least his mission, while he's in Lebanon, is to at least keep what's left, and he doesn't want to sell. And of course, one cannot really talk about the Surso family and their story without talking about real estate and land, and that is, at the end of the day, what the family is most famous for. So we talk about these things. And we talk about his family managing their history from their glory years during Ottoman rule to their eventual decline in the post-independence era. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Roderick Sarso. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. generation, you've seen, in my opinion, the best and the worst of modern Middle East history. And I, I noticed, even as someone who's younger, I've seen a lot of the beauty, the aesthetic beauty of Beirut disappear. And it's not just through violence, it's through mismanagement and, and post-war chaos. And I want to get your opinion about, you're, you're now watching what is probably the end of what was once Beirut's most celebrated architecture. And this is now a pocket. And what, what do you see the happening here and sort of where do you see things going in, in the near future? It's, uh, it's a really difficult question to answer in a few words. I think it's, it's a question of, uh, first of all, the, it's a mentality of the Lebanese. Mm. Uh, the Lebanese person is basically the, the true uh, descendants of the Phoenicians, I would say, mm -hmm. 
whereby they are mostly traders and merchants, and they are not interested in the future. They are interested in immediate future, in immediate, uh, immediate gain, immediate, immediate, uh, shall we say, uh, short-term profits. Which is a great pity because what is going to be left for uh, for our kids? Nothing much, unfortunately. I mean, tourism is being destroyed. Uh, uh, our nature, our quarries are destroying everything. Uh, the old buildings, which is the history of the uh, of the uh, of the Lebanese nation, is being destroyed also. So, we're going to be a new Dubai, maybe with not much uh, history behind us and not much future also in front of us, because I think the future can only be built on the past history. I completely agree with that sentiment. I mean, it's, it's amusing to say that, for me to say that, because I mean, I'm really basically a quarter Lebanese when I think of it. My mother, is half, my mother who's a Sursok, is half Lebanese, her mother being Italian. Yes. Her father, of course, 100% uh, Lebanese Sursok. And my father is uh, Anglo-Irish mm-hmm. with, with a German uh, mother, so, uh, oh. so it makes me a big, uh, big mix-up. You are the perfect inheritor for this palace and this part of history because you're, I think, the example of how Lebanon used to interact with the, yes. with the world. And, and, um, and I wanted to ask you, what, what is it that we did right? Because if this is our DNA, short-term gain, why is it that this city did look extremely charming at some point in its history? It's almost like um, we got something right by accident, by making Beirut the, the jewel of the Middle East. and then Yes, absolutely. I think the fact is that we were uh, run by the Ottomans to start mm-hmm. with well, mm-hmm. for 400 years, and then by the French. So it gave us a bit of maybe a bit of uh, discipline which was lost once uh, the Lebanese became independent, unfortunately. That Ottoman sort of uh, direct authority or indirect authority, whatever it was, that, that influence curtailed our short-term ambitions. Well, it may have had, have had this really difficult question to elaborate on, mm-hmm. because don't forget there were many less people also at the time. And Lebanon is a very small country, very overpopulated maybe. Uh, and the Lebanese are very fictitious in many ways. They are really more sexed than than a uh, nation, and yeah. confessionalism is also, uh, I think, a, a scourge in the country yes. here. Also, looking back to the Ottoman years and that hundred thousand or so population Mediterranean town, Beirut. Uh, the, the, also, in, <clears throat> it was a Le- Levantine city. There were many yes. foreigners, right. many Italians, many Greeks. Do you see any link between secularism and the decline of not just Lebanon but the region? over the last century, really after Ottoman rule vanished. Do you see any parallel there? Uh, I never thought of it as such, really, basically. But um, I think that during the Ottoman uh, period, there was a lot of liberties given to the people in Lebanon here. Mm. The Ottomans were not at all... uh, They were more secular than anything else, I would say, in fact. Mm. And this is... uh, a good example of that is my own family, the Sursoks, who were Greek Orthodox people yes. uh, under Ottoman rule. They were uh, the Sursoks were uh, uh, quite close to the to the Ottomans, shall we say, because my grandfather, in fact, Alfred Sursok, was uh, for many years at the uh, Imperial Ottoman uh, Embassy in Paris. They appointed him as first and second, well, he started second secretary at the Ottoman embassy. He could not become an ambassador himself because he was not really Ottoman really at the time. They were right. more Lebanese than anything else. Yes. Uh, he, I think they probably uh, hired him, shall we say, uh, only because he was very civilized, spoke French perfectly well, mm. uh, spoke Arabic, I think, also perfectly well. I'm not quite sure whether he spoke Turkish at the time. But don't forget that the Turks at the time, all those that were abroad, were highly educated and highly uh, worldly. Does that still resonate, at least in Beirut, in your opinion, this sort of uh, really worldly city? No, I think the Lebanese uh, remain Lebanese wherever they go. You just have to look at them in, in Canada and the United States. Mm-hmm. They're still all Lebanese, what, from whatever sect they are, they might, when they find themselves abroad, they always get together, which is really nice, I find. They're not quite worldly. Uh, they are more, uh, no, they're more, they remain wherever they go. They, they like to remain within, uh, within their own community. They escape their differences here and yet stick together. They stick together, exactly, yeah. yes, exactly. They stick together abroad. Right. 
whatever religion they may be, they stick together. Mm-hmm. And whoever they fought at any period in their history, they still make their way together abroad. That's right. Which is an odd thing for us because it's that's what we've done to this country. And, I mean, it's not just the Civil War. It's the last few generations of environmental decay, uh, architectural decay, and architectural ruin. We're, of course, up on a hill, so we can sort of... You're one of the few parts of Beirut where you still have access to the sea, to the sea. which has become unfortunately almost impossible. Possible, exactly, for, except for the buildings right on the sea. Right, and you have to live on the coast now to and see... And all those water. buildings are right on the sea block the view of all the other buildings behind. Absolutely. And, uh, and then you have, of course, the British Hamoud trash dump, which is, yes. I mean, making Beirut stink, and it's unhealthy, it's toxic. Uh, it, is a, it is a shame that really we're now in one of those few pockets, and maybe AUB campus is another example, of what Beirut looked like not too long ago, and of how Lebanese maybe uh, interacted not just with themselves, but with the city. Yes, but what was nice with Beirut at the time, it was basically, there were gardens, Basatin. What I'd like to say to the visitors that come here is that the mentality of this, uh, the, the mentality behind the construction of this house, in fact, is much more European than it is Middle Eastern. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's what you see is what you get. Yeah. Whereby in the Middle East, like in a city like Damascus, for instance, uh, you may enter a beautiful courtyard through back alleys and small doorways, yes. and everything is very private inside the courtyard, whereas here everything is visible to anybody. Yeah. So one garden used to lead to one other garden. But as I say, with the increase of population, the dramatic increase of population since the 1860s, uh, and be, I mean, as we know, before the 1860s, Beirut was a tiny city. I think Tyre and Tripoli and Saida were much bigger than sure. Beirut at the time. Yeah. Uh, so with the rapid expansion of, of Beirut, and unfortunately with the lack of planning, the, uh, the greed of developers, the uh, overpopulation, made it what, is, what it is today. Yes. So it's really, it's not the civil war. It's, no, it's, on the contrary, the civil war uh, prevented people from... Uh, this is the point I always yes. try to make when I give the tour. This is why the yeah. South is still uh, much uh, much less developed and much nicer yes. <clears throat> than Beirut because of the war out there. And the war that technically didn't end until 20 years ago. I that, mean, that's the, right. Yeah. And what also what was uh, very uh, bad for the natural progression, I would say, of population it was the fact that during the civil war there were, uh, there were transfers of population, mm-hmm. which was not a good thing at all. Yes, and that's primarily I'm in the mountains as well, and that's another... I think this is what you see in the mountains, yeah. yes. Do, do you have memory of those terraces and these sort of gardens in Beirut from uh, your childhood? Look, not, uh, yes, of course I do, but mm. um, when I was a kid, probably the age of my daughter now, 16, uh, 15 or 16, this mm. kind of age, uh, you don't realize uh, how lucky you are in many ways, yeah. or maybe how unlucky you may be also. Uh, you take your lot as it is. So to you, it's just childhood. It's for for me, for standard, me, this yeah. place was just a home. In yeah. fact, and that's that's it. Yes. It's only for the past, you know, maybe thirty years that I realized this is an exceptional home, mm-hmm. and it had to be preserved by all, at all costs. And were you here during the civil war at home? I was. Uh, look, I was um, in 1975 when the civil war started. I was about 20, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was at university then, and uh, we felt that the war was coming, in fact. So previous to that, many young people uh, of my age uh, started getting some military training, uh, and uh, which did not please my parents very much. Sure. There was a few uh, of my, uh, not people I knew, but a few other militia, I think the Qataris were at the time, uh, who got shot, in fact, yeah. by snipers. Yeah. And so anyway, so my parents didn't like that at all. So they shipped me out. So where were you shipped to? I was shipped to, to Paris, mm-hmm. where I did a very small training, a very short-lived uh, training at the bank, at the Crédit Lyonnais at the time. Right. And this was the worst experience of my life because people would try to explain to me what they were doing. <laughs> and at the end of the day, at the bank, at the end of the day, I would come back to the small hotel and I say, my goodness, what, what did I learn today? I couldn't, I couldn't, if somebody asked me to repeat what I had learned today, I wouldn't be able to do so. 
uh, so I got more and more depressed. So you, you, but you didn't necessarily want to come back at that point because uh, of the fighting, or did you did you want to be here at the time? I wanted to be here, but it was difficult for me to be here yeah. at the time. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, just to go back to my Paris years, so I was feeling very depressed until I asked uh, somebody who has been living in Paris for many years. I told him, listen, every day I go to this bank and try to explain to me what they do, and I can never understand what they're doing. He said, don't worry, the French are very good at that. <laughs> it's because they want to keep their jobs, and they want to, sure. they want to make it very transparent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, after that, I went to Abu Dhabi. So this would be in the... In, in, in late 75. Late, oh, oh late still 1975. Yes, okay. yes 1975. Mm -hmm. Very late 75, I think by December 75, I went yes. to Abu Dhabi. Mm. Uh, and uh, I spent two and a half years there in Abu Dhabi. I loved it. Mm. It was uh, one of the best periods of my life, in fact, uh, because Abu Dhabi was, uh, was booming and uh, the people were very nice. And I was very lucky to be looked after a Frenchman uh, who, uh, who was the head of the uh, Compagnie Française de Pétrole at the time. So, which was a very impo important posting. So he took me, this older gentleman, his wife, took me under his wing. Yes. And the, re the reason why he did so is because he felt a debt of gratitude towards my family because when he first started work many years ago, his first posting was in Lebanon. Mm. And at the time, my grandmother looked after him. Oh, so this is a fam almost a family friend who... Al almost a family yeah. friend, yeah, that's right. Oh. So, uh, so it was very amusing for me because whenever he had ministers coming from France or diplomatic, diplomatic parties or whatever, I'd be invited. So at the age of 22, I had my own flat. But were you in those years looking at Lebanon from abroad? Was it sort of just like no. news, sort of keeping tabs? Don't forget that the, the, the war in Lebanon was kind of, uh, it was not a heavy fighting every day. It was mm -hmm. kind of, uh, mm -hmm. there were lulls yes. and it's breaks in the fighting and, yeah. and it took so many years. Sure. The worst fighting here in, in Al Shafi took place, the worst damage uh, took place in 1978. Uh, and I was back, back in Lebanon at the time. My mother called me, called me and said, listen, things are much better here. Yeah. Uh, we need you here in, in Beirut. So uh, being a dutiful son, <laughs> I came back, I back, which was a mistake. I should have stayed there, I should have remained there. Why, why do you say that? Uh, because the, in fact, there was nothing I could do here. Hmm. Even though they were lulls, yes. uh, I tried to set up a business. Uh, it, it was very complicated. Nothing worked properly. Uh, communications were impossible. Uh, it was very difficult. So I came back, I think, in the end of 78 here. And I remained till 81. Then in 81, I went to London uh, to try and uh, do some work. And I worked for five and a half years with the Abellas, mm -hmm. with Albert Abella. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was great fun also because there was... Uh, it was typically Lebanese company, whereby too many employees, not much, not not enough to do really, basically. And uh, the, and the people there were very nice, I must yes. say, and I enjoyed my time in in London. But London was for me kind of purgatory, <laughs> uh, because I always wanted to come back to uh, to Beirut. Mm. I've got two other brothers, for instance, and they were at school in England at the time. Oh, no, when they were older than me, so they had finished they were at university and already working, in fact. But uh, I'm trying to explain that the, uh, my two, for my two brothers, Europe was their home, really, basically. So had well, they left earlier? They had left earlier. Yeah. So they had never lived as long as I had in Lebanon. So, uh, so they made Europe their home. Yes. Whether it's London, uh, Dublin, or Italy, or wherever. Whereas for me, even though I was resident in, in London at the time, mm -hmm. uh, my heart was never there. It was still here. It was still yeah. here, yes. So when, uh, when, the, uh, when uh, the best move I ever made was to come back in full-time, absolutely full-time, in 1996, uh, I came back here full-time. But even during that time, I would come every, every year, once or twice a year, to visit my mother, who remained here most of the time. Yeah. Whenever the airport was open to the airport, if not to Junier, Cyprus, I mean, those were uh, difficult times. I think, despite you, you, you mentioned twenty five percent Lebanese, but this is a ver this is a hundred percent Lebanese story, of always returning, leaving, returning, exploring every opportunity abroad, but never feeling at home unless you're here. And I do have things to do in Lebanon. In fact, I'm very lucky in that respect. That you know, I've got so many things to look after, uh, so many things to think of. 
So there's not one minute that I'm bored here in, in Lebanon. Is, is home a different place to you? I'm, I'm, I ask in sense that my generation, this part of Beirut is associated with joy and celebration, mostly wedding ceremonies and other occasions where people celebrate. Was this the norm back then? Did you, did you sort of, were there events like that? Yes, uh, yeah. my parents were very social. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, my mother was uh, the, um, uh, shall we say, the disciplinarian at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was very relaxed and liked to, uh, liked to receive and uh, enjoy his time very much. So, in fact, my father was a social person, whereas my mother mm-hmm. was more the hard-working person. Mm-hmm. And my mother, as you know, created the APSAD, so the, the, the Association for the Protection of All Sites, and, uh, yes. and so on. And there's actually there's a great interview I was watching today with Monocle TV, where she was describing in her recent years the decline of homes in Beirut, from 600 to 300 to the dozen yes. or so to almost nothing. No, but we're talking about the about the the years previous to the war so here. So this is going back to the sixties and. 50s. So going back to the sixties, when I was a kid here, the house was very lively, also very yeah. lively. Yes. Uh, lots of. Uh, it was kind of there was kind of insouciance mm-hmm. at the time, mm-hmm. and I think the living was easier than it is definitely than it is today. You're talking about the city at large, or, yeah, or city, the city at large, and, yeah. and my experience here in yes. this house also. Yes. Um, but she set this up now half a century ago, more. Is, was it then, was it a primary concern of losing the architectural heritage of Beirut? Was it an issue? No, it wasn't an issue at the time. It wasn't, okay. Because there were many, there were many houses still standing. Yes. Uh, I remember quite a few of those houses, even in the street here, which were pulled down in the um, early 60s. Mm-hmm. So I can remember those houses. Yes. Um, but it's that generation that sort of be- it begins the transition from. What, it's what? my parents' generation, unfortunately, which yes. uh, was started the, uh, the downfall of Beirut. Shall we say, started with my, with my parents' generation. Yes. Yes. Although the street today is fifty-fifty, right? It's uh, it's literally half homes and uh, the museum, sort of museum, just across the street, which, in a way, the. The entrance to the museum says it all. It's the old Martyrs Square statue. Yes. Right there. Yes. So we're looking at the 1920s. Yes. As soon as we enter the late 19th century, early 20th century, and we're also next door to a massive tower built not too long ago. So it's, in a way, it's, it says the story in a nutshell. What happened to Beirut? Yes, the destruction yeah. of this quarter happened quite recently, in fact. Mm-hmm. All those buildings which are around us are very new. I mean, the oldest one is about 15 years old. Those towers, I think, are all perfectly legal, in fact. Legal? They're legal. Yes, yeah. Uh, but they're legal through uh, the manipulation of the, of the laws, I would say. Yeah. And a certain amount of corruption, because there should have been, there should have been a kind of... Uh, there should have been a definite height here yeah. in, in a quarter like this. Yeah. Uh, not only for the aesthetics of it, but also for the for the daily uh, running of the country, daily running of the quarter, imagine if all those buildings were, were lived in. Yeah. Imagine the traffic it would create in the morning everybody going to their offices, for instance. Absolutely. So all those buildings which you see here, some of them are uh, half, half, half empty. Which is also, I mean, aside from less traffic, but it says a bigger story, which is speculative real estate is one it's, of the biggest mistakes absolutely made. yes yeah absolutely because there's nothing else in Lebanon to invest in yeah except in lands and of course it's not just this neighborhood I mean it's amazing it's all, 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 all of Beirut all of Beirut unfortunately is like that Antari is another yes. example and this is why many people are against Solidaire originally yeah. uh, but I think Solidaire did a good job in fact because at least they, they, they had their own uh, restrictions I was recently having a conversation with Muna Halla. She yes. uh, runs Beit Beirut. And so yes. I mean, we got into the Solidaire versus municipality issue, which is, it's really hard to tell what downtown would have looked like without Solidaire. Exactly. Could have, could have ended up worse. And we don't know. And the rest of Beirut is not the shining example of what, yes. you know, of what the city should look like. On the contrary. So it's, it's always, um, 
it's a healthy reminder that despite all the accusations against Solidaire, they, they did save a lot of history. They did save a lot of history, but they destroyed also a lot of history. That is true. But yes. you can't make an omelet without making some eggs. Mm. Uh, and people are very much against Solidaire also because they think they've been uh, uh, bereft of their uh, properties. Right. Um, Which is a more shareholder, I guess, uh, yes. thing. That but I think it, the uh, the... I think the main point, uh, the main criticism against Solidaire is that it's uh, they've created a city for rich people. Uh, it's not the melting pot it used to be before that area. But I think it will come back to that slowly. Uh, because think, of its geographic location, or just no? Where? Because the uh, downtown, you know, the Place des Martyrs and so on, there was a mingling, uh, the mingling uh, pot, the mingling pre-civil war, yes. pre-civil war. Mm. And with Solidaire, this this uh, it destroyed that part of the uh, the part of the fabric, shall we say, of the society sure. here. Yeah. But it's going to come in, I think, because it, everything starts by being exclusive. And I find that, uh, like restaurants, uh, who goes to the restaurants when the first restaurant opens is that the shall we say the cream of yes. the population. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then they get tired of it, and then it gets uh, more popular and popular, and so on. Of course, though, I mean, Martyr's Square is, has been leveled to the ground. So, what I mean, it is now what, almost three decades of post-Civil War oh, yes. uh, empty space or parking lots, and that's 15 Not anymore, years. The, the loss of construction. There is loss of so construction. So, you, you, you won't be able to get a million people now in, in, uh, yeah. in downtown because all those buildings which are cropped up since... Yeah, but this your the social fabric you refer to. I I I mean, I only know it through stories of your generation, uh, my parents' generation. Yes, the, the cinema, the cafe, the uh, basically the transportation hub of the city as well. That Martyrs Square was El Budij. It was the tower of the city. Yes, and uh, today no no one even. I mean, the the thought of spending an evening in Martyrs Square is so, you know, unless I'm doing yes. a tour, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is. It is my favorite part of the city for its history, but it's not. So it's uh, become a good-looking uh, city, but without without the, the without any heart, without yeah. any uh, there's no there's no life to it really, basically, and this is visible by all the shops leaving. Yes, but this is entirely political, is because the uh, the the area has been hijacked by the politicians. Do you find yourself looking at a city that's lost its way and lost its lost its legacy? De- definitely, fortunately. But Lebanon is uh, is very vibrant by its population. I mean, very active, very dynamic, very hyper population. So it compensates a bit. <laughs> so the energy is always there. The, the, the is energy there. is always there, yeah. yes. I mean, the, the, the tourists that come here, the first remark they make to me is that, you know, that you, you've destroyed everything, but they, they're always very... Uh, Shall we say complimentary about Beirut? Because they find it so so dynamic, so interesting in many ways. Uh, lots of things are happening here in the art world. That is true. The greed of real estate developers is has is, has been overwhelming, unfortunately. And the corruption in the country. Unfortunately, nothing can be done in 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 for the preservation of the old Lebanon, for the pres- preservation of the history of Lebanon, also of not Lebanon, of the the city of Beirut, but for preserving its old buildings. Unless, uh, unless a set of laws are passed, yeah. because um, what happens? I mean, you must understand also the old landowners that are uh, that have a small property which is probably all built up around it, yeah. uh, and um, they got a small house there. Shall we say a two-story old house in uh, in the middle of uh, of a little middle of of four blocks. What can they do with it? And probably it's not even their own, entirely their own. It belongs to their other family members. So the only thing they've got left to do is really basically sell it. And if sell it to whom? To a developer who will build another tower, simple as that. And so it's that short-term profit that leads to long-term decay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Even yeah. for the de- developers. I mean, the developers, they build the buildings, they sell the, the flats, they make some money, and, and that's it, value. you see. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's no incentives for the old landowners uh, to keep the properties. There should be new laws that protect these properties by inherited, inherited taxes, no inheritance tax, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
there should be uh, facilities in, in taxation, not necessarily the government giving any money to the, uh, to the owners of old properties because they haven't got any money anyway to start with, but um, to make their life easier and easier and to, to encourage them to keep their properties. Or at least match the value and compensate in other ways. In other words, keeping the property yes, they intact. Yes, they, they, uh, they are laws. They are not laws. They are uh, suggestions yes. in that respect. Whereby, like this property, for instance, if you if there's a certain coefficient you are allowed to set you to build, mm. but if you, if you're not allowed to build for some reason, then you should be able to build to sell your your air yes. coefficients. Yes. Uh, which keeps which keeps the city intact. I mean, that's how cities preserve Yes, but this is, it's not entirely, uh, nobody understood the mechanism of that mm. particularly well. Because, I mean, supposing I had uh, air rights to sell, yes. who would I sell them to? Would I sell them to my neighbor who wants to build a tower? Right. Which is not, not that the idea, because I want <laughs> to preserve the thing. Or would that would I be sell a tragic it? ending to this point. Yes, or would I sell to, uh, uh, to a developer in a specified area whereby he would be allowed to increase his uh, coefficient of construction by buying my air rights. Right. But all that has to be plans, uh, and of course it's not being done here. And I guess that is the role of a municipality, where it's a neutral body that does not get persuaded by money or greed or corruption. That would be the natural role of a, of a yes, municipality. Yes, that would be a, a, in an ideal world. Yeah. Yes. I, I know that it's, of course, not just mismanagement, it's Lebanon's addiction to driving. And I look back, the older you go back in Beirut's photos, the fewer the cars, the more pleasant the city. Of course. And the tram network, that's gone, of course. The uh, our train is gone. Uh, train is gone. All our public transportation are gone, is gone, unfortunately. And that's, I mean, that's governance at the end of the day. Yes. And, one of the most but still, there are the, the, I mean, for instance, my, some of my employees come here every day by taxi service and don't seem to complain at all. It seems to be working all right. But it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a... Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I wanted to park not on the street. I wanted to walk in Sursa Quarter to arrive at your house. It was impossible. Just to give you an idea of how it's become so inaccessible, the city doesn't even doesn't let you walk at ease. No, you cannot walk at ease anymore here. And the hardest part about creating the tour that I give over a decade ago was finding a route that you don't get run over. Yes. You don't, you know. Or you have to, because you're here, you have to walk in an engine file. Exactly. You can't walk two by two or no, the pavement. No way. No, and and you're, you're lucky that the sidewalk is not parked on. Yes. It's unthinkable now. I came from Marim Khayel to your house. So we're... You kept driving. I ha yeah, because yeah. the idea of walking... Yes. It's very hot also. It is very hot, but even, even in the nicest time of the year to me, which is February, the perfect weather and the cut, the sky is blue, the air is a little cleaner because of the rain, even then it's not the easiest place to reach by foot, and it should be, because it's short distance, literally down the hill. Beirut does not attract pedestrians. It doesn't have public, it doesn't have any decent public transport. And... I think the car did contribute to Beirut's decline. But it's also it's very difficult to prevent the, uh, the citizens from you know, driving their car to Beirut because you don't give them any alternative. Yeah. In England, for instance, in London, driving in, in the centre of London has become fantastic. It's become free and everything, but it's more expensive. Yes. And it's reserved for the people who actually live in the city. Right. And there's uh, an incentive to use public transport. And there's a great incentive yeah. to, use, absolutely, yeah. to use public transport. Right. Um, but you can't do that here because there is no alternative. There is no parking lots for people to come from who live outside Beirut. Ideally, they would be able to have to park. They would have to park in huge parking lots which don't exist. Yeah. And from there, take public transport uh, into Beirut. You can you can see that that was the intention sixty some years ago. Charles Hallo, of course, yes. our famous bus depot, which is. Four it's or empty. Five. I mean, there's no. Is it, what, I don't understand why. It makes no sense. Or what's more is that all those um, newish buildings, even buildings built in the 60s or the 50s, all have kind of basements with parking lots. Yes. But they use as as warehouses, as shops, as yeah. uh, uh, as depots. They're not used as parking lots. 
But also you see the buildings that were built not too long ago. I mean, mm-hmm. pre-Civil War buildings where they don't have underground parking and they were three, four, five stories high. Uh, people survived. They parked because there was enough space to park on yes. the street. And and it, I always, I part of me gets really hurt when I see these massive foundations. I mean, huge foundations. One of them now in Marim Khayel, the old Laziza factory, which is a huge development site. Have they started? Well, they, I think they finished digging. They've, they've pulled the building down? Oh, uh, two years ago. Yeah, it was knocked down. And it's, uh, a, it's, it's a crater. It was a fabulous building. No, great building, and it, yeah. had, it had purpose. It was history. It's Laziza. Yes. It's a brewery. Yes. Yes. And now it's called Marim Khayel Village. I think the names do say part of the tragedy. They do help explain what went wrong yes. here. Yes. I, uh, your your family story is maybe the quintessential story of what you were referring to as the Lebanese spirit, because this is a family that is old and is part and parcel of Beirut. I mean, hundreds of years now, centuries of one family that has contributed a lot. Let's project a hundred years from now. Yes. Do you think that? this family will sustain all that is happening in this part of the world. So let me put this into context, in fact. Mm-hmm. So the Sursox uh, were uh, huge landowners, all the way from Turkey to, to Sudan even, all along the coast of yes. the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So Syria, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, of course, Palestine, Cyprus, mm-hmm. uh, Egypt, and I think also some business in Sudan, as I was, as I was telling you earlier. Vast stretch. Vast, vast stretch. So this is not only Ottoman. This is beyond. I mean, this is more than the Ottoman uh, boundaries. We're reaching now Sudan and. Well, well within the Ottoman boundaries. And what's oh, very inter- okay. yes. Well, well, what is very interesting also is that the um, the will of my great grandfather, the one who built Musa Sursok, who built mm-hmm. a house here, mm-hmm. is a thirty-three page uh, manuscript uh, detailing all the properties he had. He had. And what's amazing in that is that the uh, the properties there's no there's no country mentioned. Mm. It's all part of one empire. Yes. Uh, and uh, so it's very difficult to uh, to determine which country it is now today. Right. And don't forget that at the time, at the time of my grandfather, or even at the time of my parents before 1948, you could drive from Beirut to to Cairo and to Alexandria. It's, it's unthinkable, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. You could pass through Jerusalem on your way to you could, you could go anywhere <laughs> in the Middle East. At the yes. time, the Ottomans could even do better than that. Yeah. Everything was one huge country. Right. The heydays of the Sursok was in the, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. Uh, and then the big decline was in the, in the early uh, 20th century. Decline meaning just in terms of... Uh, of power, assets and, power uh, assets and, and everything. Yes. But not entirely of their own fault, a bit of their own fault, because I find that when families uh, extend too much, like, a bit like the Roman Empire, <laughs> if you're not able to control your, uh, your assets, control your, your, your borders, your boundaries, then there's an automatic uh, invasion or decline in the power of the, uh, the families. Mm-hmm. So that, it's not entirely their fault, I was saying earlier. The, the also, there was the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, so this yes. worked away a lot of the properties. Yeah. Uh, there was the nationalization in Egypt. My mother was a single girl, in fact, single daughter. The only daughter? So The only daughter, uh, so she yeah. had no immediate family, but she had her cousins. Yes. Uh, but most of the, uh, the riches of those cousins were the ones in Egypt, and those are the ones that got nationalized overnight. Right. So they had to uh, they had to leave Egypt. Some of them came to Lebanon, and most of them came to uh, went to Europe. And the Sursok have declined greatly here in 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 Lebanon, but the the one who um, who had kept most of her assets only because she was a single daughter was my mother. And she did her best to run her properties, but not unfortunately not as well as she should have because. At the time, uh, everything was delegated to uh, to gérants, to the gérants, to the uh, to managers. Oh, yes, right. And unfortunately, we had a succession of managers who were crooks <laughs> uh, and who uh, swindled the family tremendously. So when I came back to Lebanon, my view was to try and keep keep everything together, what was left to keep it together. My aim was to try and stop this hemorrhage. Yes. 
I'm not a Sursok 100% myself, but I'm more a Sursok maybe in heart than anybody else. <laughs> um, because I find that it's, it's terribly important to keep, to preserve the name of the family here. Yes. So this is why I'm opposed to any kind of selling of properties. This is under your, your, your control, that you're... Uh, what, whatever was my mother's, yes. uh, which I run now, mm -hmm. uh, or part of it, because it was divided between my brothers and myself. Yes, yes. Um, we're trying to, to keep as much as possible within the family. You, in a way, you're fighting against history, too, because the, pers the trajectory is, is going the other way the, completely. Uh, going the other way. Yeah. So this is why I'm, I'm, I'm adamantly opposed to selling anything. Yes. And so this is why I'm making my life a bit more difficult because I have to try and find ways to, uh, to keep all those properties without, trying to, without having to, to sell any of it. I'm always curious about pluralism and its benefits to Lebanon, whether or not that is the lifeline to this country. Mount Lebanon, shall we say, before the creation of Greater Lebanon, was mostly the home of Christians and Druze people. But when Greater Lebanon was created to include uh, the, the, the coast and the towns of Tripoli and so yeah. on, mm -hmm. and the Bekaa, yeah. uh, was to create a kind of uh, equi equilibrium, not only a Christian society, but a mixed society. Yes. And because of the, of the demography, I think the Christians find themselves a bit now under threat. There is a kind of equilibrium, equilibrium of fear. Absolutely. No. That's what it is. Yes. yes. Which, is, which is not right. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's fine because we, we got along more or less. Uh, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't work like that. Because Lebanon now is constituted basically in three parts. There is the, the Christians who are divided between themselves. Yes. <clears throat> the Shias who are all powerful now. Uh, and the Sunnis who are also divided between themselves. Yeah. Not only between themselves, between the Christians, between the Shias and the Sunnis, the yes. Muslims. Yes, yes. So this creates an equilibrium, which is not long last. It's not going to last very long, I think. Oh, you think that that will tilt towards a, a renewed it, violence, or is that no, just no? More? I think the you know, it's fine because the, the country is divided into three basically, mm. and three equal parts. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the fact that the, the communities are fighting in between themselves, mm. the same community is fighting between itself. Yeah, uh, makes it easier for the others to survive. In many ways. So, so long as there's internal rifts among each community, yes. this country will more or less slug along and yes, well, limp. slug along is the word. Yeah, but we want to do better than that. Right. Yes, I think it's. Uh, I think uh, nobody. Nobody last want to say that. I think the country should be run by technocrats. We don't need any politicians in this country here. Who? What is? What is Lebanon? It's, it's the size of a small town in 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 the world in Europe. Four million people. Four and a half million people. We don't need any politicians, and the kind of politicians we have are the worst kind. Also, I a politician is really basically the servants of the should serve the the, the people. And when I see them here coming here, for instance, last time there were there was a party with all those ex ministers coming uh -huh. with their bodyguards. The example which is set is terrible. I think they make uh, the average Lebanese who wouldn't mind staying here line up at an embassy and get a visa and get out. They set the worst example. They set the worst example of yeah. most politicians, not all of them, but most of them. The ones that you they just... don't understand. Yeah. I mean, they think that you want, once, what are the couple politicians here? The couple politicians to make money, really, basically, and to be in power and to have their cars and their bodyguard. Yeah. And all those troubles now in the mountains, I mean, I don't quite understand the trouble that's happening today in the... Uh, in... in uh, in the Ali region, yeah. it's due mostly because of those bodyguards. It's too many weapons in this country. Too many, yes, but I mean, yes. We, we, we adjust quickly. We got used to a few things. But this is the trouble with Lebanese. We, the Lebanese people are so inventive and so adaptable, uh, is that they, um, they adapt to situations, to very bad situations, they make the best of a bad situation, in yeah. fact. And this is why they never could, they never do a revolution. We should have done a revolution many years ago here. But the, okay, let's. The people should rise up against their uh, against their, uh, their uh, governors, the people they. But unfortunately, they're all people they elected. Even the young Lebanese people are very traditional in, the, in their in their thinking. They all elect the same people, the same families, the same feudal laws, and so on. You are right. 
But yeah. th- but doesn't this go back to the power sharing that we were talking about? Each community fends for itself, and it never really is able to bring out the best of its own. Yes. That a a at the end of the day, a Lebanese Shia politician will be re-elected over and over. Lebanese Sunni, Lebanese Maronite, Lebanese whatever. Yes, I know. It's yeah. But they will never... There's no revolt against the order because each community is perpetually fearing for yes. its survival. There is a little movement now against uh, against that, but it's, yeah. it's, it's not very... Like Beirut Medinity. Yes. When actually, Mona yes. Hala, she ran on it and she said yes. that uh, it was so frustrating because everyone in that team... All they wanted to do is just clean up the sidewalks, uh, plant trees, you know, enforce m- bare minimum zoning and fix fix Beirut for yeah, whatever. That's, that's already something. And they couldn't do that. And yes. even that is sort of looked at as a sectarian issue. Anyway, I'm very proud because I voted for the last elections. I voted for the uh, independence uh, mm-hmm. candidate, Paula Yacoubio. Yes. I don't know whether she's good in doing a good job or not. But anyway, she's at least indep- well, so-called independence. Did you flirt with politics at some point? Were you thinking about it? The fact that I didn't go into politics is mostly because I, I don't speak Arabic well enough. And I find that in order to go to politics, you should be able to explain yourself very, very well and be very clear and very, uh, very concise. Uh, but you should, you should be able to manipulate the language very well. And personally, I'm not at ease in front of microphones and in front of TV cameras and things like that. But the good news is you've been political in other ways, by hosting events that do address issues, by, by willing to embrace civil marriage here in your... In your in your palace garden. Yeah, this is accidental, really, basically. But uh, well, but it's symbolic, and it, and maybe in Lebanese context, it matters. No, more. I think I think my contribution to to Lebanon was to try and preserve the uh, the properties which we have, which are not, which I don't think belong only to the family, but belong to the whole of Lebanon. Yeah. Like the this house is a unique house which we kept not only because of the family, but should be kept for as a, as as a testimony that uh, that life in Beirut was more or less civilized 150 years ago. Yeah, and it's it's quite nice that you let you let people visit, you let people yes, access absolutely. the yes. property. On, yes. And, but you're, and the fact that we kept the, we're trying to keep the hotel also up and so far. I saw a presentation on a documentary recently that a lot of it is still there. I mean, it's not... A lot of it, no, the hotel is, is beautifully built. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it should be preserved at all costs. Your accomplishment is holding on to what's left. So, in that sense, I and I want to thank you personally for keeping a bit of our history alive. And you're 25 percent Lebanese. I'm 100 percent Lebanese, but I think you're as as Lebanese as anyone else. And you're probably more Lebanese than me in the sense that you have leverage here. I don't. <laughs> I don't have any leverage here at all. Unfortunately, I don't know anybody in, in politics particularly. Oh, I see. Well then in that sense, we're maybe in the same camp today. <laughs> we can just talk about these things and, and look back a bit. Thank you for your time today, Roderick. I really Thank appreciate it. My pleasure. A story of family history of family inheritance, of a family's name that is central to any family when it comes to Lebanese history. The next time you walk down Sursut Street and you reach the end of the street and look left, take a look at the palace and take a look back in time. And if you're ever at a function that's taking place at Sursut Palace Gardens, really take advantage of being there because it is such a respite from the urban chaos, congestion, and pollution that defines Beirut today. It's really taking a journey to Ottoman Beirut, and there's only snippets of this left now in Beirut itself. AUB, LAU, and perhaps Sursal Palace Gardens is really what's left of that era. Preserved, maintained, And so long as no one's eager to sell these properties, hopefully here with us for the foreseeable future. Over the summer, for episode six of this podcast, I interviewed Abdullah Slam, and we talked about civil marriage. 
and we talked about the ceremony that would eventually take place at Cerso Palace Gardens. Now, born out of that discussion was uh, perhaps a difficult conversation with Abdullah and his wife, Mary Jo Abin Asif, about the following episode with the Minister of Interior, Ray Al Hassan. Uh, we had a difficult exchange of whether or not I was able to challenge the minister effectively on those few minutes where we discussed civil marriage itself. I took the position that my conversation with her was really getting her word on the subject. And I was not trying to ambush or put anyone in a difficult place. The same thing with Abdullah Slam before her, and the same thing with Nadim Shahadi before him. Uh, the academic, the uh, legal, the political issue that impacts the civil marriage debate, I thought was worth exploring step by step. Earlier, I wanted to speak to both Abdullah and his wife, Mary Jo. And for, unfortunately, scheduling-wise, it just didn't work out. We hear her voice in episode 6. There's a brief intermission where vows are exchanged between her and Abdullah. And we hear her voice shared with Abdullah's voice at the end of the episode when they're reciting the legal principles defining the cause that they both share. They both want civil marriage law applicable domestically in Lebanon. So I offered a solution. Rather than keeping things tense between us, why not simply record a follow-up episode with Mary Jo this time and let her share her opinions and a healthy exchange of maybe a foundational disagreement we have and why the Lebanese state behaves the way it does and where the burden should lie and perhaps at the end of the day where real power is when it comes to Lebanon. And we also share Mary Jo's personal relationship with her father, a former Lebanese general who passed away at a time where Lebanon's post-war environment was really reshaping the state we live in today. And we get into all of the things that her father stood for when it comes to the state, a fundamental belief in state sovereignty, and his career surviving the entire civil war dedicated to the Lebanese army, what those principles mean to her personally, and beyond that, her own personal journey. I think she did something outrageous and definitely worth celebrating. She left a successful career in law in New York to pursue a childhood passion of hers, opera. And I really admire her ability to switch careers very quickly and succeed in a career that is very difficult to get into at a later stage, and she's now touring in Europe and pursuing her dreams on her own terms, and I really admire that. So we get into all of the above in next week's episode with Mary Jo. I hope you enjoyed today's exploration of family inheritance and family legacy with Roderick Sirso. If you're enjoying this podcast, subscribe through your preferred podcast platform or find us on YouTube search for the Beirut Banyan channel. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.